Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to another important episode of The New World Next Week. Everything you need is at NewWorldNextWeek.com. James, we'll begin with essentially a cluster of stories that could take up this entire episode of Geopolitical Rundown, where a lot of things are happening even as we speak. And we'll begin with the situation in the Ukraine, the latest I have from the Washington Post. UK, Ukraine opposition sets 24-hour deadline as the protests rage. Ukrainian opposition leaders issued a stark ultimatum to President Yanukovych on Wednesday to call early elections within 24 hours or face more popular rage after at least two protesters killed in confrontations with police in a grim escalation of a two-month-long political crisis. The protesters' deaths, the first since the largely peaceful protests began last November, fueled fears that the daily demonstrations aimed at bringing down the government over its decision to shun the European Union for closer ties to Moscow over human rights violations could turn more violent. James, there's almost a similar situation playing out in in Thailand, on another part of the world, but your take on the very breaking situation in the Ukraine. Well, uh, there's a lot to say about this, but for people who don't know what this is really all about at the end of the day, I think we can summarize it by saying that once again, the Ukrainian people are being used as the ping pong in this game that's taking place between forces both within and without of the, without the country that are bo- uh, trying to basically uh, use Ukraine to forward their own geopolitical agendas. So for people who want the, uh, the, the real story, I mean, more or less, this started with um, the Ukrainian government overspending with money it didn't have. Surprise, surprise, where have we heard that before? Um, Getting into that economic hole when they tried to restructure their their loans in order to avoid default. No one was going to help them out with that, so they turned to the EU for some help. The EU offered them an agreement that was all sunshine and rainbows, except for the fact that it was um, just atrocious in terms of some of the, the conditions and strings that were attached to it. Um, and when uh, he, Yanukovych um, looked and, and, sa- and basically out of desperation was about to sign it, uh, Russia said, well, if you sign that, we're going to raise tariffs on you because Russia knows that this is really a part of an EU NATO agenda against them through the Ukraine. So then he rock in a hard place. What do you do if you sign on the dotted line? You're going to lose 400,000 jobs right away because of the Russian tariffs. He ends up not going th- through with it. People erupt into protests because uh, s- supposedly there's this ideal of Europe going on, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the original impetus of this was, though, I think quite clearly this has moved far beyond that point right now. This isn't about the EU anymore. And in fact, this is becoming bifurcated and uh, there is a wedge being driven even among the Ukrainian people themselves. People in central and uh, western Ukraine are there's that's where the most of the support for this rebellion is coming from. The southern and eastern parts of the uh, country are horrified at this and even more so now that this is turning into violence and bloodshed and death. So it is becoming um, a, a situation that's out of control and and I think w- to understand where the, the rebellion is coming from, I mean, obviously there are people in, involved in this who really, truly are um, upset with Yanukovych and his government, and, and perhaps deservedly so. But I think we have to place this in the context of the Orange Revolution back in 2004, uh, funded by all of the very same groups and people that have been behind the Egyptian Revolution and some of these other destabilization campaigns, Otpor and the National Endowment for Democracy and USAID and, and uh, George Soros's Open Society. Institute and all of these main players, um, literally the exact same team that, that brought you the Egypt revolution, etc., were there in 2004. And I think we have to understand they were fighting against Yanukovych then, and now people are fighting against Yanukovych again. It is, again, it's Ukraine is being used as the ping pong in this ch- in this match between Europe, NATO, Washington, the Western powers versus Russia. And uh, I don't think either side of that is blameless or spotless or perfect or beautiful. And uh, unfortunately, again, the Ukrainian people are being squeezed in the mix there. And uh, I know I've already said a lot, but I just want to turn people's attention to an excellent article up on CNET about a disturbing whole other part of this story. Uh, Ukraine texts citizens, hey, we see you're in a mass disturbance, uh, talking about some very Orwellian technology whereby the Ukrainian government is basically identifying individuals by 
by their cell phones and where they are and, and then determining they're part of the protest and sending them text messages to say, we know you're part of this protest. Very, very creepy stuff going on. And that's an excellently written article as well. Very, very interesting article. So I'll, I'll put that in the show notes so people can go to it. But once again, um, the both, both sides have an agenda and they're basically using the Ukrainian people as the ping pong ball. So it's it's another situation where it's it's proxy wars. The proxies are different, but the the string pullers are essentially the same. We'll include those links as well, some live stream video links to to see in real time what's going on. James, the situation in Thailand, state of emergency begins as Thailand copes with protests. You can get more of that via the republic.com as protesters vying to overthrow Thailand's government stayed on the streets this past Wednesday despite the start of a state of emergency that comes with curfews, a ban of public gatherings, and the ability to censor local news for the next 60 days. The hat trick completion of our geopolitical rundown here in just this first segment of New World Next Week. Geneva 2, they're calling it. Day one of the Syrian peace talk, so called end on fragile ground, and that comes from the Columbia Broadcasting System. All of those links, again, are, are essentially developing, and it's up to you to go keep yourself up to date and keep yourself informed. James, having said that, we'll move to our second story this week via RT and posted to my own cyberspacewar.com for a little bit of positive news. U.S. judge rules IP address does not prove online piracy. A U.S. federal judge in Washington wrote that a suspected Internet pirate should not be prosecuted solely because his computer's IP address was identified by a film studio. The landmark opinion may tip the fortunes of defendants in similar situations. The Hollywood execs behind the movie Elfman filed a lawsuit against hundreds of people alleging that they were guilty of copyright infringement because their internet protocol, IP address, was found to have illegally downloaded the film. An IP address can be likened to a computer's online fingerprint. Each is somewhat unique to the machine it originates from, or, or at least that's the idea. Copyright holders seeking to take offenders to court often put fake movie files online, record the hundreds or thousands of IP addresses that download it, and then provide that information to the courts in an attempt to identify and sue hapless users on the other side of the screen. The studio argued, James, quote, the defendants either A, downloaded the pirated film themselves, or B, permitted, facilitated, or promoted the use of their internet connections by others to download the film, end quote, according to someone who does have some skin in the game. That would be torrentfreak.com. This is Washington District Judge Robert Lasnick, and he said this week that the rationale, the Hollywood execs' rationale, is insufficient in part because it begins, James, with the assumption of guilt. Ruling on a motion to dismiss the claim, Lasnick sided with the defendants because the conditions described in complaint section B were overly vague. And we get to the crux and, and wrap this up. Quote, the movie studio has actually alleged no more than the named defendants purchased internet access and failed to ensure that others did not use that access to download copyrighted material, the judge wrote. Lasnik also said that there was no proof that the person who could wind up facing a lawsuit was in fact the person who chose to download the copy of the fantastic piece of art known as Elfman, James. Well, welcome to Internet 101, U.S. court system. I'm glad you finally realized that IP ad assigning individuals to an IP address is ridiculous because, uh, again, I mean, even if we were to assume that people download things via their own IP address and if people are out there to do illegal things, um, they would obviously spoof the IP address through proxies, which can be done exceptionally easily online. So I think IP addresses in these investigations mean almost nothing. But even if we were to assume that they are associated with a certain person who owns a certain account, then you're holding that person personally responsible for anything downloaded through their IP address, no matter what mitigating circumstances, no matter who actually downloaded it, no matter what person was uh, breaking into it and hacking into their Wi-Fi or whatever it is. I mean, it's a ridiculous standard to hold people to, and uh, it falls apart under even the, the briefest scrutiny to anyone who knows anything about the internet. So this is, I mean, just common sense, but I'll go 18,000 steps further and say that in this day and age, we can't take any conviction based on anything supposedly found on anyone's hard drive for any sort of uh, proof of anything because even the New York Times now admits that the NSA can hack into and change the files on your hard drive 
even if your computer is not connected to the internet. So there is no way to really protect your electronic device other than sitting there in a Faraday cage, which uh, I'm pretty sure most people are not going to build around them. Um, there's no way to protect your devices from that, and anything found on your hard drive could, at least potentially, even according to the New York Times, have been planted there by the NSA. So welcome to Orwell's uh, Nightmare Vision, and unfortunately, uh, uh, it just means that absolutely no convictions um, based on what is supposedly found on someone's hard drive could really stand up to uh, to uh, real scrutiny in, in the court system. <laughs> Man, and, and just even today at work, there was an IP address issue where one of the IT guys came running up to my desk asking where somebody was. It happens all of the time. IP addresses can be, even just in, in your regular day-to-day -day life, can be fudged or messed up. That's not even including what you just talked about, all of the other spook traffic going on. James, uh, for our third and final story this week, in lieu of perhaps our sometimes usual food or health-related story, we'll continue with the tech updates with something I, fi I find really fascinating, James. Google Glass. Story folks may have caught over the last couple of days, again, posted to cyberspacewar.com, coming via Ars Technica. Homeland Security agents Hold up Google Glass moviegoer. A patron of an AMC movie theater in Columbus, Ohio, was detained this past Saturday for wearing Google Glass while watching a movie, according to a report from the Gadgeteer. The glass wearer, who wishes, at least for now, to remain anonymous, was pulled out of the theater mid-Jack Ryan shadow recruit, which is hilarious, and questioned for an hour by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Special Agents. The man recently had prescription lenses fitted to his Google Glass and wore them in to be able to see the movie. According to his testimony published at The Gadgeteer, an agent approached him about an hour into the movie, yanked the glasses off of his face, and commanded the man to follow him outside the theater. Five to ten cops and mall security personnel were all, of course, waiting for him. James, I, f I guess I find Google Glass m really fascinating because I don't, I don't recall a time where the average person out there, out in the world, is beta testing products. I can't really remember a time where, other than now, Google Glass, where there are people out there in the world already being pulled over, already getting into court cases. There was the, just the case recently where the judge ruled in favor of the Google Glass, where some kind of traffic infraction, we can include that story. James, what's what's your take on Google Glass? Well, I think we have to pole vault over these types of uh, stories that are coming along right now because I think this is prelude to what the bigger agenda is. And I think the bigger agenda is obviously, I mean, it, it's in Google's interests and the government's interests and all the interests of the big players to have this as the kind of universal type of technology, whether it's Google Glass specifically or whatever brand of whatever company. Uh, this is the way that this is all heading because they obviously want to eventually work us towards the implement, Im implantation of the brain chip. I mean, that's where this is all going. So they don't want to, to, to single people out and to have people, you know, arrested for this. I mean, that's obviously bad PR. Where this is heading, of course, is to say, well, you could be recording anything you're watching at any time, including copyright and material. So we need to monitor everything that you're watching at all times to make sure that you, you aren't uh, recording anything illegally. We have to be monitoring all of your activity because, you know, you could be doing something illegal. And that's, I think, where this is ultimately going to head. When you buy the Google Glass or whatever, you're going to sign the waiver saying, well, of course, so you, you can look at all my data to, to make sure that I'm not doing anything illegal because, you know, otherwise you might have to arrest me at the movie theater or whatever. And uh, so I think that's where this is all going. And, uh, and again, it's uh, what, if we sign on to it, if we literally buy the technology, we are literally buying into the control grid. So you've got to put your foot down somewhere. And uh, for me, I think uh, Google Glass might be that line in the sand. And, of course, James, it doesn't stop there. A little related will include from the BBC, Google unveils smart contact lens to measure the glucose level in your tears. So, James, having said that, we'll wrap up this 179th episode of The New World next week. I do want to mention, I, I was teasing it a few weeks ago, and now it's starting to pay off. I've done a couple of new interviews over the past few days. I got to interview Toronto MC Kale Sampson, and that's been published. And today I also interviewed uh, author Howard Soons about the 27 Club. So we'll include links for those as, of course, I, I would implore folks to check out all the work in the media monarchy kingdom. 
awesome stuff. And I know you're working on some other new stuff for the new year. So I'm looking forward to all of that. Uh, I hope people are staying tuned to MediaMonarchy.com. We'll leave it there for this week. James Evan Pilato, thank you again for your time. Thanks so much, man.